Good evening, good afternoon, uh, anywhere uh, you might be. Uh, my name is Pierre Edouard Vincent, and I have the pleasure to welcome you today to this uh, Tech Tuesday number six for SP Brazil. I'll do the introduction uh, in place of uh, Sergio Cavalcante, who was uh, unable, unable uh, today. So, for the um, topic of our discussion today, exciting uh, topic, we'll discuss source control and uh, subsea well response with Brett Mori at OSRL. Um, I will now uh, welcome to the stage uh, Fred Maya, who will be a co-moderator for the discussion. Um, we encourage you to take um, uh, enter your questions in the uh, chat box uh, if you would like to ask uh, questions after the chat. Uh, and the discussion will take uh, probably about 30 minutes for Brett and followed by Q&A uh, moderated by uh, Federico. So Federico, over to you. Okay. This is a privilege to stay with this guy discussing about emergency response in, in deep water. I, I, I was uh, retired from five years from Petrobras. I worked in my six last years in Petrobras uh, coordinated some discuss not discussion some operation of the emergency response in deep water after macondo and for me is a, a privilege to stay with this in the discussion and uh, talking in some solution that uh, we improve during my time in petrobras Okay, Brad. Yes, um, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you for having me here um, to, uh, to attend this SPE Tech Tuesday. I'm, I'm honored for the opportunity. Um, I guess um, a brief background, um, I was involved, um, I used to work for BP uh, back in the early 2000s and 2004 and 2005, I was a member of the Atlantis Deepwater Development Team. And the rig that I was um, on for the batch set for all of Atlantis was the Deepwater Horizon. So um, I, I knew I knew that rig intimately. I was on it for two years, so I got to know, know, know a lot of people. Um, so um, when Macondo hit, I was actually working for Exxon at the time. And um, like everybody um, that was in the deep water, we all got brought back into that response. So I spent the the remainder of Macondo uh, primarily onshore, um, but also running around the Gulf Coast, working on assembling hardware for contingency operations, um, building subsea equipment, being involved with the, the actual subsea response uh, with the ultimate capping of the well. Um, after that, um, I ended up um, moving over into a company called Trendsetter Engineering. I was one of the founding members of that company. Um, we were contracted by Exxon immediately following Macondo to build the first of many capping stacks. Um, and, um, you know, being in the right place at the wrong time, uh, wrong place at the right time, I don't know. But my career, uh, it just trajectory post Macondo, it is just everything that's source control related. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's basically where I've ended up. I've been fortunate to work with some great people at Trendsetter. Um, I was able to make an impactful um, contributions to the industry um, with the you know patents for certain equipment. Um, I helped uh, develop processes, um, software, educational software, and um, I became uh, sort of a, a key member of the industry source response team when it comes to deep water capping. Um, out of all of that, I was approached by OSRL last year to come on board, and I was, again, honored um, that they, they saw something in me that uh, merited uh, asking me to join the team. So I come to you today as the subsea manager for the Americas um, for Oil Spill Response Limited. Um, I'm headquartered here in Houston, although I jokingly refer to myself as Brazil North. 
um, because we actually have an office in Rio, in the in the port of Rio. And uh, we have a base down there. And I work very closely with the personnel um, uh, in, in that facility. And I consider myself a North Brazilian. So with that, uh, Jan, I guess if you want to go ahead and pull up the, uh, the slide deck, um, Jan is going to um, present the slide to, to us today. And um, once it comes up, I'll stop talking. And, um, and then we'll just go ahead and we'll advance, uh, we'll advance the slides. Okay, so if um, if everyone's happy, I'm just going to go kick off this presentation. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, Pierre Edouard for the opportunity and for SPE Brazil, um, again, for the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, as the title suggests, I'll be presenting on the history of source control and uh, the recent advances within the source control realm. As I've said before, I'm Brett Mori, um, and I am OSRL's subsea manager for the Americas. If you can advance the slide, please, Jan. So some background. Um, oil Spill Response Limited are the largest tier one oil spill response organization globally. We are a not-for-profit organization. And more importantly, we're consortium owned by most of the super major oil companies. Uh, we provide preparedness support to operators during the planning phase of a well. We also provide subsea, surface, and aerial response hardware and personnel in the event of an oil spill. And we also act as the conduit into specialist service providers. Today's presentation is going to touch on the history of source control and will give you some insight into where our industry is going as this sector of the oil and gas industry continues to evolve. Next slide, please. Okay, the history of source control. We can't discuss the history of source control without discussing the history of well control itself. Um, these next few slides are gonna take us through the evolution of our industry and the key critical events that have shaped our responses. Next slide, please. So on August 27th in 1859, Titus Drake successfully drilled the first oil well in Titus, Pennsylvania, starting our industry. Early wells used no well control equipment and gushers were common. If a well did come in, wells were dug and the well flowed with the oil being collected in the pits. Wells would blow until pressure was depleted and then they would insert pipes into the into the pit, if you will, and that's how they would collect the oil. Not very environmentally sensitive. Next slide. So in 1861, less than two years later, our industry suffered its first documented casualties when a dozen men died in a gusher explosion in Pennsylvania. During this time, the use of mud weight in the bore was the first well control method. In 1901, the Lucas Gusher in Beaumont, Texas, came in with over 500,000 barrels of oil collected in one of these pits and was lost when it was ignited. Uh, just click, please. Next. Just to give you some indication of, of, of what Beaumont looked like back then crazy. So in 1913, Carl and Myron Kinley extinguished the first blowout by using explosives. The explosives robbed the blowout of oxygen long enough to extinguish the flames, allowing the brothers the ability to get close enough to the well to cap it. So 1913 was the first evidence of a cap on a well. In 1922, Jim Abercrombie and Harry Cameron filed a patent for the first RAM type BOP. And then in 1932, HL Patton designed the first dedicated on land capping stack with a manifold of divert flow. So the capping stacks aren't new technology. They were just new. Um, they were just new to the offshore. 
Next one, please. So brief history, uh, well control. In 1933, the first relief well was drilled in Conroe, Texas. Um, and then the Eastman Company utilizing mining techniques to perfect dr directional drilling to improve the accuracy of results. Now, I'm not going to lie. I don't know how they were able to use magnetic film to help direct a relief well into an intercept. That's just black magic and voodoo to me. Um, but it just goes to show that um, we had some pretty smart people even back as in the 1930s. Okay, next slide. So on land, capping stacks and relief wells were the primary means of blowout response for the industry. And this trend continues today. Next, please. Offshore, as wells moved away from the shoreline and into deeper and deeper water depths, the relief well became the primary means of a blowout response. Next, please. During this period, industry suffered many well control events resulting in a loss of life, property damage, and pollution. But very little changed in the offshore industry. It was business as usual. Next. You can see here uh, some of these images um, from the 70s through to um, this last image was in the 80s. Next slide, please. So in 1979, the Ixtoc well in the Mexican Gulf suffered a kick and caused the rig to catch fire and sink. The blowout lasted for 10 months and was only brought under control after a successful relief well was intercepted and killed the well. It flowed uncontested for 10 months, spewing millions of barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. It was the first major attempt to conduct a subsea source control we didn't have divers because we sorry we had uh, divers in lieu of ROVs. Um, we didn't have ROVs back then. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, it was shallow enough that the divers were able to try to attempt remote control operation of the BOP. The project attempted use of a containment dome. A junk shot was also attempted, and surface disbursements were used to help break up and disperse oil on the surface. This may sound familiar because this is exactly the steps that we took during Macondo as well. Um, we look back to the learnings on Ixtoc um, and we attempted the same methodology again on Macondo. Next, please. So, although not a well controlled event, the Exxon Valdez incident was the catalyst for the requirement of regulated oil spill response and contingency plans and increased capabilities in the United States and had global repercussions for oil spill response. Next. During drilling operations spent enormous sums of money and time preparing for oil spills, but their efforts did not include anything dealing with the subsea well and source point. Next, please. These efforts and regulations did not affect the upstream exploration or the blowout response side of our business. Next. Drilling continued for another two decades and the occasional incident here and there. Okay. Montera. So while BP's uh, deep water spill in the Gulf of Mexico was worldwide new, news for months, the worst incident of its kind, uh, time, sorry, kind in Australia occurred in August 2009, just prior to Macondo. Um, and it, le it leaked for 74 days before the well could be brought under control. The Montero oil spill occurred after a blowout on the Montero wellhead platform. Next. The blowout occurred on the H1 well, while the West Atlas Jackup was drilling rig was operating over another well at the time. 69 workers were safely evacuated from the drilling rig. The rig was shut in via an intervention well, which was successful after numerous ranging runs. The intercept was completed on the 3rd of November and mud was pumped in it to kill the well. The Thai operator estimated that the flow of oil may have been between 1,000 and 1,500 barrels per day in the early stages 
and declined to 400 barrels per day later. In total, it was estimated that 30,000 barrels were spilled, pr plus presumably a good deal of gas and condensate. The total surface area over which oil or sheen was observed at one time or another was around 90,000 square kilometers. Next. And then we had Macondo. Next. So upstream was finally faced with its Exxon Valdez, driven in no small part by the media interest and oil spill and images of a burning modu had on the local population. Next. Next slide. So everyone likes the top 10 list, um, though this is one we can do without. Um, you'll see that Macondo sits at number two position of all-time worst oil spills, even overshadowing Ixtoc, which came in directly below that at number three. The only incident that was worse that was man-made by the retreating Iraqi army as it left Kuwait during Operation Desert Storm. That's when they blew up all the wellheads as they were evacuating. Okay, next. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the formation of source control in a post Macondo world. Next. So, click, please, advance. So, source control is a term which is used to describe all response operations conducted in an effort to directly intervene with and attempt to halt the flow of hydrocarbons from the source control, source point, sorry, the well boy. Source control activities and missions can generally be divided into three response objectives. Those are capping, which is an attempt to shut in the well mechanically, containment, which is a contingency operation to minimize the environmental impact by flowing the well to surface for capture. Um, this is in the event that you can't physically cap the well or you can't do a full shut in. And then relief well. Relief well is the attempt to kill the well hydraulically by drilling into the original well bore and introducing heavyweight fluids into the reservoir at the incident well location. Next. So how does oil spill and source control differ contractually in the event of an incident? Uh, next. So as with traditional oil spill response, the initial response equipment is usually sourced, staged, and maintained by third-party organizations who conduct these activities on behalf of a group or consortium of operators. These organizations are referred to as OSROs, or Oil Spill Removal Organizations. OSROs are typically provide the manpower to operate and provide equipment and a planning to respond. As mentioned previously, several organizations and companies now provide global equipment response coverage. However, unlike a typical OSRO, the majority of these organizations do not provide the manpower to operate the equipment, the planning to respond, nor the large logistics response required to support capping and containment. Depending on the subscription provider, it is typically the responsibility of the responsible operator to source all these additional assets. So this puts huge uh, onus and burden on the operators that are drilling these wells offshore that are responsible for these wells in the event of a well control event. So there is uh, some, I, I wanna say light at the end of the tunnel, There's, there, are, there is some hope, a glimmer of hope on the horizon. Um, OSRL are working to change some of this by working with the operators to assist the operators now with logistics and access to specialist response companies through our global subsea response network. I'm going to talk about that in the next few slides, but this is sort of the evolution of source control. Um, and, 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 and we're starting to, well, we've been listening to all the operators and their concerns. And it's now we're in a position to actually action some of these um, requests and, and provide that support. Next slide. So capping stack hardware, something that's near and dear to my heart and which is consume me for the last 12, 15 years. Okay, next slide. So initial industry response. The initial industry response was concentrated on the hardware. 
The first bespoke cap and stack emerged in February of 2011 um, with many more to follow. So when we built the first stack, I honestly thought, how many do we need? And I figured we'd build two or three. Um, and when I left uh, Trendsetter in July of last year, um, we built 14. So what do I know? Next slide. So now we have a global coverage of capping stacks. So there's three pri principal consortiums. Um, we have MWCC and HWCG. These are consortiums that are geofenced or ring fenced to the Gulf of Mexico. You probably haven't heard of them. Um, but MWCC or the Marine Well Containment Company, um, they're the consortium, the original consortium that came about out of Macondo, and it was made up of all the super majors. They were the ones that financed the build of the first stacks that we were contracted to build. Um, following on behind them was another consortium that was created for the smaller operators who, though smaller in number, they still had a requirement. They still had wells that needed to drill. They just didn't have the deep pockets, and but there was more of them. And that became known as HWCG. OSRL, the company I work with, work for, uh, is called Oil Spill Response Limited. And we are the international consortium. Whereas MWCC is ring fenced to the Gulf of Mexico, we're the equivalent operator or OSRO globally. We have five stacks now located in locations around the world. We have one in Brazil in Rio. As I said previously, uh, potentially when I was talking earlier, um, prior to this, prior to the, the to the uh, to the session, um, that we have a stack in 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 Rio. Um, we have one in Norway. We have one in South Africa. One in Singapore, and we also have one being positioned in Guyana uh, later this month. Wild Well Consortium or Wild Well Control also have two stacks. They have one in Aberdeen and one in Singapore. Next slide, please. So initially, um, the capping stacks uh, were based on BOP RAM technology. Um, the, the first stacks we built, um, there was a there was a moratorium on, and we were tasked with building stacks as quick as we could. So we basically went to industry and uh, we just started calling around on on, on colleagues and companies asking what they had available. And, and in all honesty, the first capping stack looks like the first capping stack um, because that's what we could get our hands on. Um, you know, the, the initial RAM, although it's subsequently been replaced, uh, was a test RAM from NOV. Um, the, the chokes that we initially uh, assembled um, were chokes that Masterflow had that were sitting on the floor because a client had, had canceled the order and they had them available. Uh, gate valves, uh, again, ATV in Italy had these gate valves. Um, because of the moratorium, they had a client cancel their order, and those were available. So that's what actually drove the original design for these capping stacks. It was hardware availability. So the initial capping stacks, um, their size and weight resulted in limited logistics and deployment options. You, you may do with what you had. The problem was when we were... When you're begging begging for hardware, you uh, we use the phrase "you can't look a gift horse in the mouth." We weren't going to turn down a 50-ton ram. Subsequent to that, these rams were very heavy, um, and because they're very heavy, they started to limit our deployment options. You needed to have very capable vessels offshore to deploy them. Because these rams um, had BOP technology, hydraulic volumes are required to operate them subsea. The deeper you go, the hydraulic efficiency of these rams becomes less and less. So that the knock-on effect of that was you needed to have more and more hydraulic capacity. Um, and then the rams were not designed for shutting on flowing wells, so closure times became very critical. Ultimately, the, the technology advanced, um, and as we started progressing and in, in the source control space, and as it became more competent and more understanding of um, the, the, the wells and the environment that we were having to operate in, 
um, the, the industry advanced as well. And now we were able to um, get access to gate valve technology that met our temperature and pressure requirements. So the latest generation of capping stacks are based on gate valve technology, production gate valve technology, I might add. Um, so their compact size and reduced weight result in access to more vessels and deployment options. If you're using gate valves instead of BOP rams, um, you're saving um, a lot of weight just in those components because now you're using gate valves that can be operated with uh, manually versus hydraulically. You're, you're cutting down on the amount of hydraulics that you need. So you can get by with less bottles. You can get by with an ROV tooling skit. Um, um, it, 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 it made the, these stacks simpler to operate and ultimately lighter. Um, and the other good thing about this is now that we're using production gate valves, erosion, while still always going to be a concern, um, it was less of a concern than, um, you know, exposing elastomerics to, to potential cut in, in a high discharge environment. Um, these, these production gate valves are in canal clad they're designed for 20 and 30 year service life and they're designed to, to close on flow. Next. So the latest advances in capping stack technology improve on the response times required to get capping stacks into remote regions. We're doing this by uh, making them air freightable. This is one of the more recent advances. Um, we now have stacks that are rated for temperatures up to 400 F or 205 C. Although I can tell you that I'm talking with one of the operators right now that have a reservoir that even exceeds that. Um, and we're also looking at 20,000 PSI uh, maximum allowable shut-in pressures. We haven't seen 20,000, but we have seen reservoirs that are 18,000 and above. Um, the Norway and Singapore stacks are now suitable for rapid deployment on an AN124. Um, the Guyana stack um, is the lightest of the bunch, and it's suitable for rapid deployment on a 747-400. Um, the, um, the assembled weights um, now for some of our lightest stacks are around 40 tons. Um, and that puts them in the sort of the realm of uh, the weight of a production tree. Water depths have increased. Um, the initial design spec called out uh, 10,000 foot water depth. Of course, in the last few years, um, as people are aware, we've gone deeper than that. Um, the current stacks have been rated to 12,500 feet. Although we're currently going through um, uh, an analysis to re-rate the stacks to 13,500 feet or 4,100 meters. Um, and that's for some, um, some potential wells uh, offshore in Colombia. So we keep going deeper. Um, we keep encountering higher pressures. We keep encountering higher temperatures. Um, so because of this, um, it, it seems there's a, still a, a market for bespoke, well-engineered capping solutions for some of these um, deeper plays. Okay, the next slide I'm gonna show you here, it's a video and I'll shut up for this. I'm not hearing the audio. Doesn't matter. I'm not gonna sing. So what we're looking at here, then I'll just I'll just ad lib over it. Um, this is the Norway stack, and the stack in Brazil is a duplicate of this. Um, we have uh, an air freightable shipping skid. This is this white thing that you see here. We have two of those. We have one in Singapore, and we have one in Norway. Um, and as you see here, this is the Antonov, uh, the AN124. Um, this is the company um, that are we're, we're based in Kiev, in the Ukraine. They're a Ukraine company. Um, they have since, because of um, the issues that are going on with Russia right now, they've moved all of their base operations over to Leipzig in the former East Germany. Uh, so they're flying their planes out of uh, out of uh, Germany now. Um, the stack that you saw there, um, it was. That comes in just under 120 tons, and um, the the it, 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 as you can see, we were able to um, 
we were able to take off with an Antonov 124 and fly. Um, with, with that particular plane, we can be anywhere on the planet within three days um, with that equipment. Next slide. So the future of source control. Next slide, please. So where are we today? So until recently, I'd say within the last three or four years, general focus has been on compliance to regulatory requirements regarding the equipment. We were all concerned about the equipment and less about the preparedness for a response. And it wasn't because we didn't know about it. It's just that building the equipment took a disproportionate amount of our time and focus. Now, though, luckily, for the most part, um, the equipment aspects of a source control response have been addressed by industry, and we have ongoing improvements occurring, as evidenced by some of the previous slides. Industry is just now starting to shift focus towards preparedness. Regulators and operators alike are taking a more proactive approach to training and competency, and this can be seen in workshop attendance around the globe. I attend on average so five or six a year. Um, and then one thing um, of note, which I think is going to be prevalent for the audience here today in, in Rio, in, in Brazil, is the fact that we now have aging infrastructure that is starting to drive focus towards lighter weight components and lighter weight hardware, which is you know one of the reasons the, um, the capping stack that was designed and built for Guyana was created. It was sort of the first of the stacks that identified the fact that we need a lighter solution. Next slide. So we've also entered an era of collaboration that's been reflected in the creation of a global subsea response network. Remember a couple of slides, well, earlier on in this presentation, I talked about the difference between surface and subsea, um, basically the OSROs, um, and then um, the, 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 the kit source control and where it was basically just the hardware and the operator was responsible for identifying the vessels and getting the personnel and, and everything else. Um, so one of the takeaways from the request from the operators was they're asking for help in this space. And so we've created the Global Subsea Response Network. So what you see here on this slide is the current list of the Global Subsea Response member companies. Um, so why do we have this, right? So a source control response in many re respects is not business as usual for these service companies, right? And they carry unique contractual and operating risks, operational risks. Um, if you're deploying a capping stack from a vessel nearby a blowing well, that is a significant departure from the norm for some of these vessel companies. They're not going to want to work with you in a response with standard terms and conditions. So OSRL help overcome this hurdle by facilitating the contract language necessary to protect these service companies and make contracting for emergency response services less onerous for the operators. When activated for a subsea response by its members, our OSRL's formal responsibility stops at the handover point at the key side. And we have to, that's from an indemnification standpoint, right? Because remember, we are the not-for-profit consortium arm of the consortium. So we have to protect the interest of all the operators, not just the operator that's having the incident. That's what we call the red line. However, we can help facilitate an effective response beyond the red line by engaging with these strategic partnerships and, and, and negotiating these framework agreements that members can then leverage in a response utilizing the GSRN. So ultimately the member retains full accountability. However, OSRL are seeking to facilitate an effective response between the service providers and the member underneath the umbrella of the global subsea response network. Next slide. Okay, so from a preparedness and planning perspective, I, I refer to this as the peacetime operations. Um, industry has come together to support operators through our global subsea response network again, but now we're looking at it from a peacetime perspective during the pre-planning. 
We are now able to provide overarching project management support to help facilitate well engineering services during the planning phases of your drilling campaign. I'm working with one of the super majors right now. Um, they have a campaign going on in the Middle East. Um, they're really resource constrained. If for a company even as big as they are, um, they have a they have a limited number of people within that business unit. So they've reached out to me, and I've been able to um, engage with uh, third party uh, engineering, well engineering companies to provide them with that support. Um, so within this. Each GSRN partner plays a pivotal role throughout response phases, spanning from planning, mobilization to well isolation. So all of these member companies, you know, we have specialists in deployment, sea fastening, marine operations, um, worst case discharge modeling, relief well plans, blow contingency plans, um, logistics plans, source control emergency response plans, all of that. The involvement of all stakeholders in a deployment planning ensures clarity and responsibilities and accountability. What I'm finding is because I've gotten this core group of third party providers now, the, the work product that they're creating for operator X is same as the, the work product that they're creating for operator Y. And a lot of the times, especially in certain regions, when these different operators are then submitting their, their designs for their permits into the regulators, the regulators are seeing a unification or a standardization in the reporting and the, and the documentation. And it makes it easier for everyone. And lastly, with the preparedness side of things here, which I can't overstress, proactive planning avoids delays in response and in particular logistics requirements. Um, some of the smaller operators um, who are sort of feeling their way in this space, um, they can come to us and we can be the sort of the, we can be the tie that binds for them and, and work with them um, and support them. I, I just did, I just did one in Colombia for an operator. This was their first deep water. This was their first offshore well period. So we were able to work hand in hand with their team, with their drilling team, with their wells team, with their IMT group, and 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 take them through the entire process next one please so another new service that is available to subscribers is direct access to specialist response staff from the member operators themselves um, via our mutual aid framework agreement which is held by us osrl so if you're in a region and you're drilling a well and you have Equinor in the region, and they're not an affiliate of yours. You have Exxon in the region. They're not affiliate of yours. Um, you have BP in the region. They're not affiliate of yours. Um, they are signatories for this mutual aid framework agreement. So if you're a subscriber, um, you can reach out to these companies and request their help. So this agreement is not applicable for routine operations, it's only in the event of an emergency response. The request has to come through us um, for legalese, oper I guess, as a buffer. Um, and there is no obligation to sign up, but for me, it's comforting to know that an avenue does exist to get access to emergency personnel. They can decline you, by the way, um, but the contract is there and I would hope that if you reached out to them and you needed additional personnel for, you know, to backfill 24 hour operations to become uh, key members of your IMT team or in particular your source control desk um, to uh, to help you with mission planning, then, you know, these people would be available. Next slide. So our GSRN members uh, recently mobilized two capping stacks for MWCC and HWCG in the Gulf of Mexico. And all our consortium members gained the benefit of these exercises. Um, the primary reason I joined OSRL in July was because the last job that I did at uh, Trendsetter was to be um, I guess uh, one of the one of the, the the key people 
um, tasked with the mobilization of the two capping stacks for the two consortiums. Um, both of these were successfully deployed in May, and then I decided to take the month of June off to recoup, um, and, and then I joined OSRL in July. Um, the great thing about these exercises, um, you know, the, the benefits um, are you get an enhanced understanding of the Global Subsea Response Network and the Swiss members and the individual operators' responsibilities and interfaces. Um, you're, you as an operator get to work with the offshore installation manager, the ROV superintendent, um, the, the well engineer, the well control specialist. Um, you get improved coordination in mobilization, installation, and deployment of the equipment because we work with the installation contractors, we work with the, the rigging companies, um, we work with Trendsetter on the actual um, deployment um, and mobilization testing. Um, out of all of this, we end up with identification of critical safety measures and you know technical consideration technical considerations. Um, because every every time we do one of these, we learn something new and you know, lessons learned are are critical. Um, and more importantly, the collaboration leads to an effective response. Not only the collaboration between the regulators and the operator, but the third party providers of these services as well. Let me see here. So this graphic that you see here, um, this was taken during the successful mobilization of the MWCC capping stack, uh, May of last year. And this was deployed onto a suction pile and temporary wellhead um, that was deployed in 6,000 feet of water. Most of the member service companies that make up our GSRN network were directly involved in the successful ex execution of this mobilization. So that's, that's, that's very important. Next slide. So planning for the future. Uh, next, please. So with two successful mobilizations offshore under our belts, we've been able to achieve, uh, next, continuous improvement based on exercise findings and participant feedback, enhanced understanding. Members now have a deeper understanding of the roles of the GSRN partners, OSRL and the oper operator, next. And we've strengthened our industry-wide cooperation for improved subsea well uh, outcomes, well control outcomes. So through these exercises, we've now got a better understanding of the roles and responsibilities necessary during a subsea response. And we've detailed how the operators and the GSRN representatives would work together across different response stages. The exercises highlighted a strong fact that a complete response requires a network of specialists. The view among the OSRL Swiss member consortium is that having access to the GSRN and the OSRL Swiss member mutual aid agreements provides a high level of preparedness for these low probability, high consequence events. Next. So this is a video there that was um, provided to me by Trendsetter. I'm showing it to you here as an indicator of what the future holds. Discussions are now ongoing regarding aging infrastructure and a requirement for even lighter weight capping stacks that also pre permit post well kill intervention, right? Um, our colleagues at Trendsetter generated this video, which highlights the capability for a lower riser package of a light well intervention system to be reconfigured as a capping stack. Now I'm, I'm including it here, you know, just to show you as an example, um, but it does show you that there is available hardware out there that you could potentially modify, um, especially in areas where weight is, is a huge concern, especially for some of these older um, infrastructure where, you know, wellhead fatigue is a concern. Um, and, and some of these, uh, some of these wells, you know, these aren't high discharge rate wells. This may be, um, um, a perfect, uh, complement to your, to, to your hardware. Now you need to have a subscription for a capping stack. You need that for your permit. Um, so, so, you know, th that's not going away. That requirement is there, but 
if you have, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure Pierre Dwar is probably going to talk about this because I know it's near and dear to his heart. And it's something that you know I'm 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 interested in as well, especially for Brazil and other uh, mature fields. Um, is this is stuff that we we need to be looking at? Next slide. Okay, so uh, to reiterate, um, we need to focus. Well, focus is shifting to preparedness. Um, all aspects of a response need to be addressed, not just the hardware. Um, our source control response has now matured. We, had, we now have access to training and e-learning courses specific to source control. We now have drills and exercises that are yearly events for a lot of the operators, and the quality of the exercises have steadily improved. Industry now has a much better understanding of the steps required for a successful loss of well containment event and the identification and sourcing of required response equipment has become second nature for a lot of the operators. We now have access to qualified and competent emergency response personnel and planning services, including logistics plans and SCURPs, or source control emergency response plans, plus um, the companies that can provide detailed engineering studies. We built the fire trucks. Now we're training the firemen and firewomen. Last slide. So thanks for sticking with me. Um, I hope this was informative. It was very high level. Um, but I, I, I'll ask I'll ask Jan to leave this slide up for a little bit or I provide my contact details to anybody on here today who would like further information on anything I discussed, or if they have any questions, they Feel they'd rather ask uh, privately. I'm, I'm I'm more than happy to 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 engage. It's you know it's part of my remit. Um, just one thing, I, I I try to keep the commercial nature out of this, and I'm going to try to adhere to it as much as possible here. I just want people to know that OSRL uh, in the past, you know, we had huge debt with a lot of this hardware that had to be repaid. And because of that, the price for access to these services was pretty, it was pretty onerous for a lot of companies. Now that we've paid off the hardware, we're able to provide all of these services I had mentioned in over the last 30 or 40 minutes, um, much more um, cost effectively. We can do per well, um subscriptions that give you access to all of this stuff um so anyway that's it thank you very much for sticking with me those of you who did i hope you learned something from this and again i really appreciate the opportunity source control is near and dear to my heart thank you thank, thank you brett so for, first of all apologies from me for uh kind of skipping the mini bio at the end, at the start at the start of the um, presentation which which was uh we, we were supposed to give to for you so apologies oh, for that yeah, sure. thank you very much thank you very much for the great uh, the great presentation uh, which which you aced uh, Brett uh, and um before we go over uh, taking maybe some questions from the from attendees or from uh, Fred, uh, I will absolutely say, yep, the uh, very timely, very relevant to the region, relevant to Brazil, and as you very uh, very well detailed in your own presentation, emergency response, not just capping, but also containment or collection and then relief well in for many of the uh, uh, projects. And it is a complete response, um, including um, trying to get better at it. I, I definitely uh, pick, picked up on that. And, and, and we think the same on, uh, you know, on this, on moving towards greater preparedness, not only because it is better for everyone, better for environment, potentially lower exposure uh, for people, but also because in, in major incidents, it, it, it can break, it can break a company. So having, being well prepared, including financially, 
So you have negotiated conditions up front, etc. There's there's obviously a big a big merit to, to, to that. Um, and before yeah, well, we we continue on on some of those points. Uh, Fred, any any questions, comments, or, or or specific points you'd like to discuss with Brett? Well, well uh, <clears throat> good presentation, Brett, and we. we the operator know the problem, the amount of problem is to respond uh, uh, if you took a, a blowout in deep waters. It's very, very expensive. Maybe yeah. after they blow, they, they respond to blowout, you are out of business. <laughs> Your money goes through the pipe. <laughs> and uh, what I, I, <clears throat> I think is about the preventive. The, the, the Macondo incident and Montara incident is, is occurred by simple preventive action that was lost. You change the fluid in the well and don't pay attention to the flow and the beat level. You only have uh, not confidence. <clears throat> you pay attention only in the leak test. Not not look to the uh, uh, the level of the fluid that you are take off the the well. It's it's, it's simple. This is a, 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 a first. Uh, Pay attention of the the people that uh, work with well. So Pay the attention to the left. Yeah. The left the left hand side of the bow tie. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Source uh, control obviously yeah. is the right hand side of the bow tie. Yeah. Um, and if 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 the and another another thing is about lesson learning. Uh, Brett, that's no in, in PA. Four months before. Uh, uh, Macondo incident occurred the same thing in North Sea with the same drill operator and another operated company. But the same, the same problem. The difference is that in North Sea, the BOP is shooting the well. And in the Macondo, when the, the people try to shoot in the well using the BOP, he don't function. You have problem with the BOP. And in order yeah. to see function, and because I, the BOP is staying preparedness and, and, and close the well. And, and again, on on that, I I agree with you, uh, uh, Federico, that the the risk pyramid you will have you know so many near misses and and similar incidents, very close calls, and then only one one really major mm -hmm. major problem. But um, Prevention, absolutely. It will not completely eliminate the risks, especially not when we're pushing the frontiers of what we can do, both in terms of temperature, pressures, depth, uh, remote uh, yeah. locations, uh, etc. So, yeah. Okay, but the trigger is a simple uh, solution. It's, it's not complicated. You don't need uh, engineers, uh, high competence people. It's simple. This simple cause is 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 uh, escalate to a uh, one macondo. If the people in, in in the horizon pay attention of the level of the trip tank and something like that, don't occur. Yeah, only pay attention in the the. Uh, 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 so left hand the, the side. Test the cement test left hand Not side looking. barriers yeah. are e equally yeah. equally yes. equally important equally important the, the, now simple <laughs> now on, on the on the right hand side uh, of of the uh uh bow tie the there is definitely a time factor so which, which will minimize the financial uh impacts will minimize the impact to the environment, 
etc. And 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 yes, as we have discussed with uh, previously separately with with Brett, in there's a lot of, of value in operators getting together and preparing something together. You know, mutualizing resources, making resources available, uh, vessels, ROVs, uh, cranes, all sorts of things that that in wartime could become completely unaffordable. And, and as Brett specifically said, you're not in a good position to negotiate at this point. So having an agreement between operators, which has been started in Brazil through the IBP um, for a group of, of operators, there's, there's obviously gains for pretty much everyone except maybe you know the the biggest national operator in Brazil can can think that okay there's there's not much it, for them to gain by joining forces with smaller players so but but for a lot of the other players there's uh, value in getting together preparing a better response and and OSRL is a company that that can help uh, do that. Any any thoughts, uh, Fred or, or um, uh, Brett, on on developing a specific, a Brazil specific kind of TSRN or, or a version of of that no, using I, using Brazilian I, companies? I, I can suggest that the, the each well is different, and the move function very well, but when you, you, you know, one incident occurring normally damage the LMRP as uh, something like the 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 BOP yeah, could debris be removal. damage debris yeah. removal absolutely and if you pay attention in Macondo stay a large amount of time to develop a solution to can connect above the LMRP because you have uh, uh, drill pipes inside the BOP you you can't connect the people is, is stay long time is studying a solution that man could connect uh, above the, the, the LMHP. Th this is the problem because if, if, if nothing is damaged, it's, it's easy. It's like the, the movie. Oh, go for connect, not finish. But something in the well, you, you push the well. It's not easy it in the vertical. <laughs> You need to construction crossover with the, co the compensated the, the deviation of the well. Th this is a, a problem, and, and you you need not the the, the uh, high quality hardware that OSR have is very nice, but I I can use this with a damaged well. Who make this? Uh, but, but, but you you have to plan for all these contingencies, Frederico. You can't assume that you're going to have a damaged well. You can't plan your response. You have to allow for all contingencies. Now, to, to your point, Pierre Edouard, regarding regional, I 100% think there's an opportunity specific for Brazil um, because Brazil brings its own contractual requirements and legal requirements that are specific to Brazil. And I see the merit in you guys, and we support you where we can, generating um, a core group or a, a work group, if you will, an SPE work group of okay. operators, like-minded operators, because then we work with you, with your lawyers, with the operators lawyers and work with the regulator yeah. To, and so, you, so that's that's important, and I and I and I and I see I see that opportunity, and and, and we've had discussions, and we're fully. I personally, uh, as is Vicente Alevato, who's our not only our base manager in Rio, but he's our regional manager for the Americas. So you have a Brazilian who is in a senior position within the OSRL organization, living. So, he's living in Baja. But he his entire remit is the entire North and South America. So I work closely with him. We're committed to working with you guys, but it, it has to come from you. And and 
and you mentioned, and, and rightfully so, uh, Brett, the, uh, the the specificities of Brazil they're and the unique. regulations, they're the unique, but but also there, there are other factors such as tax regimes, etc. We always assume that in wartime, everything would go, you know, you'd get waived waivers for personnel, for importation, for all, which, which might not happen. So these, these are practical barriers. The other one is completely different, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the occasion to mention it, is there are lots of great resources and smart people in Brazil that can, yep. that can readily help. So, and so we, we should it's leverage it. Typically that. from Brazil, we have a lot of meetings with a, a labor minister to how to get international people to work together when in, in, in this case. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of meeting with a uh, uh, aduana yeah, how to customs. simplify the, the process so, to to so, catch uh, hardware from outside yeah. so you know we, we we we, we want to take we want to take the experiences and the experiences gained by our legal team in generating the global subsea response network so we have a roadmap to success there Take that, work with your companies, work with your legal, right? Work with your regulators to come up with a structure that works for Brazil specific to specialist Brazilian companies that are in this space. You still have access. If you're a signatory to the Swiss services, you have access to the Global Subsea Response Network, right? You, yeah. you know, so what the well, Technique FMC, right? You have access, they're there. You can go to them, you can leverage, you can contract some of their vessels, right? But you, DOFS, DOFS Subsea, as an example, they're, they're a pretty prevalent uh, vessel company in Brazil. They're not part of our global subsea response network. But I would suggest maybe having contract language in place so that you can charter a DOF boat. The yeah. Scandi Niteroi, the, the this or the that. I know Petrobras have access to this vessel. I don't know if their contracts extend to emergency response or if or if it's just yeah. normal operations. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, the, but you, you don't think only in Petrobras. Petrobras is one I use of Petrobras the because I, rec <laughs> I I mentioned Petrobras yeah. because I'm speaking about the Scandi but. Niteroi, which I know is under contract to Petrobras. I'm using that as an example, Frederico, because that's just what I know. Um, yeah, Petrobras is the big company in Brazil. I don't have doubt about this. Yeah. But Petrobras don't need to pay for everything. This is which occur. We have. No, I, a, I, and and I'm, not, I'm not stating that either, Frederico. I'm just using that as an example. But this is where we can have all the individual operators come together. Right. All right. And and and, and more importantly, pre have these agreements in place when you can agree to the terms and conditions and conditions not in an emergency response but in peacetime where you can have those conversations without yeah. being bent over a barrel <clears throat> yeah. so um so gustavo escher i don't know if i'm mispronouncing your 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 name gustavo your last name but i i noticed that you had a, had a, had a comment in here can, can we uh look at that one pierre dwarf absolutely so um gustavo writes he had the opportunity to visit the rio osl osrl operation site during an amp technical visit since when is guyana capping stack available so the guyana stack is a supplemental service it is going into georgetown guyana it's currently here in houston undergoing um final fat and an efat it will be on the boat headed to Georgetown probably around the 22nd of this month. We're hoping to have it in May, the first week of May. Um, we have the cruise coming down uh, to Georgetown the first week of June, where we will do the full, uh, full assembly test and site receival tests, uh, at which point it'll be certified for use. Um, and, and the reason we're not doing it any quicker is because um, they don't need it until I think it's August or September when they're drilling for their next drilling campaign. So 
short story long, uh, by mid June, that system will be in Georgetown and it'll be assembled and ready for use. Currently it is ring fenced to the equatorial margin as I understand it. Um, but I'm still waiting for direction from the grownups and the regulators within, uh, Guyana. So the next question, uh, I'm currently taking my master's R and D of sustainable oil spill response, absorbent material. Would you say it's an open market to innovation? Um, what are the main Osros in the South America region? So you're touching on an area of oil spill response that I know almost zero about. All of my experience to date has been subsea. Um, so I'm part of what's called the Swiss group, subsea well intervention uh, service. The this is normally the remit of our environmental units and our surface or SLA or surface group. I can absolutely tell you that everyone is interested in anything that improves on oil spill response and absorption. If you'd like Gustavo, um, if you want to reach out to me separately or via email, I can definitely get you in touch with the environmental group and you can have those conversations with them, especially in light of the fact that you're currently doing your master's degree. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're strong proponents of continuing education and I'm sure they would love to dump a bunch of information in your lap. Um, so what are the main Osros in the South America region? Again, um, I can't answer that. We have people within our group that are specialists in the surface. Um, I was privy to an email this morning um, that um, Tristan Barston put out to one of the operators. He had a question specific to the Caribbean. And in that, he sort of gave a high level overview of, of where we are in, in, in this space. Um, Pierre Edouard, you may actually have better insight. Maybe, maybe you're like me. Maybe you just have your environmental guys that deal with that and you, you uh, trust them to, to do the work. I, I, again, Gustavo, for this, if you're looking for discrete or specific questions, again, I can get you in touch with the, the people within the organization in Fort Lauderdale and in Southampton who can absolutely answer those questions. And, um, and even potentially some of the people within our base here in Rio, um, they may be, they, oh, actually, I know what, the, the, we have people in the base, Mariana in particular, uh, Mariana Braga, she will be able to answer those questions for you. The next one, what is the advantage of a minor operator to be part of the consortium, being that a major one, major event that doesn't, will eventually take care of response mainly if it's a public company. Um, is there any regulatory pressure towards signing a con? Okay, so I'm assuming your questioning is why should we sign up for a consortium if we're a small company and we have an event that's just gonna, we're gonna be dead in the water and it's going to have to be taken care of by larger companies. Is that the question? Because if it is, my answer to that is that's a very short sighted view. <laughs> yeah. um, and and I would question whether that operator should be given the right so to operate in that space. I could maybe I'm totally taking so this wrong. Let, let, let me let, let me offer a slightly different read on on the uh, the question. Maybe. So OK, maybe, maybe, I, I hope maybe. I misinterpreted it. <laughs> If, if what, uh, so uh, Gustavo, in, re in response to that, if you're a very big operator with all the contracts in the world in a given country, you have a very predominant uh, position there, you, you probably do not need um, access to the, you know, global subsea response network necessarily. Maybe you have all the contracts in place. If you do drill 
specific wells that are kind of pushing you drill wells anyway and especially if they're frontier wells then you might enter discussions with a company like osrl because you want to have something that you might be able to use should something go wrong to cap uh, or for debris removal or for you know so emergency equipment that you do not necessarily use all the time and you do certainly do not want to have to buy it and maintain it which which is really historically how osrl started a bunch of big operators got together and they agreed on after many hard conversations on specs and they kind of agreed to all chip in and pay for acquisition of that equipment and maintenance of that equipment, which is historically was Brett, what, what, what Brett was referring to when he said the debt had been paid. It was an initial set of equipment that was very um, capital intensive um, that, that finally got amortized and then the debt was paid, you know, by subscription from this initial group of operators. So some of that equipment now is available to other members potentially that do not, they no longer have to pay yeah. uh, uh, the same amount of money because they did, didn't have to put the money up front for the investment. So yeah. We don't have to pay down the debt. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's free and clear now. <clears throat> now it's literally just a maintenance contract to, to oh. add to that, to add to that Gustavo um, in peacetime, even these super major companies, I'm finding that as big as they are, and I'm talking the largest now, so you can figure out which one that is, they regionally within their BUs, they struggle sometimes. And the benefit for them is we've had a huge upheaval in personnel moving around different companies. It happens. It's just the nature of the beast. For me, I have specialist engineers that I have in my really short Rolodex, okay? These are specialist engineers that I work with on my condo. Case in point, the engineer who actually did the relief well intercept for my condo, he's a guy that does my relief well plans. There's, there, he's he's peer-reviewed so many SPS, SPE documents. You'll all know him if I mention his name, but I'm not going to do that to him. I don't want his inbox getting blown up, but he left a brand. He left a company to move to another company because better offer, whatever. This operator through their supply chain, they have a contract for this company, the company that he left. They now no longer have access to the individual who was the specialist who they were using for this engineering studies. He's over here now. Well, if they go back, we'd like to think as engineers that we rule the roost and these operators and these companies. It's the lawyers and supply chain that dictate. And when you have supply chain saying to you, you have to use this company, you can't use this company, this other company where this guy has gone to. You're up creek without a paddle. So I'm talking with these operators and they're belly aching and they're, you know, lamenting the loss of this individual. And I go, well, I'm, my supply chain isn't telling me I can't reach out to this individual. So I can easily go to this new company, set them up in my supply chain. I can make them an approved vendor. I can reestablish that link to this specialist engineer. And now Exxon, instead of going to this third party provider, they're coming direct through me now. And because I'm the not for profit in this, I'm the contracting mechanism. Now they have contracts with me. They don't have to go to supply chain for that. So now they're contracting with me. I in turn turn around and I submit the PO to this, uh, this new engineering company. And now they've got the direct conduit into the engineer, which they lost access to. That's one of the huge advantages to this GSRN. And more importantly, if we have these contracts, let's say in, in Brazil, and we're the contract holders for a lot of these companies, then maybe, you know, maybe Trident Energy has uh, a, a contract with this, this engineering firm or, or this test firm or this vessel contract, but the other operator may not. 
But if we can, if we can structure a regional global regional response network with these contracts, then everybody come through OSRL Brazil, and everybody gets access to these specialist companies. I see that as a huge benefit, which is why I'm. I really hope that Pierre Edouard can 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 circle the cats, and 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 we can do something in the region that will actually be a benefit to the individual operators, because I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to expand the value beyond just a subscription and saying, okay, we've spent the money and here regulator here's here's my Here's 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 my access uh, agreement, and can I have my permit to drill now, please? That's that's fine, but I want to be able to provide you with the well engineering specialists, all the pre planning stuff, the logistics execution plans, the source control emergency response plans, the worst case discharge, the landing analysis, the blowout contingency plans, the relief well plans. I'm not doing that. So on on on. Brad, Brad, uh, who in? The OSLL <clears throat> will make a drill exercise in Guyana about the capping. So right now there is a there is blowout a, control. We're we're looking at an exercise either later this year or earlier next year. We don't know right now if that's basically just a tabletop exercise. Um, there were rumors. No, I'm not even going to mention it because there were only rumors and I don't want to deal in rumors. Um, I can tell you that we're talking with uh, an operator in Brazil for a similar type thing um, uh, about potentially mobilizing um, the capping stack offshore in a similar fashion to what we did for HWCG and MWCC. But, you know, we are consortium owned. So it's really going to come down to um, all of the operators um, giving buy-in to um, allowing this operator to to take the uh, the uh, the asset and and take it offshore. So we have exercises, um, you know, your typical conventional exercises. Um, the question is now um, whether we take that exercise to the next level by actually physically mobilizing assets. To date, yes, we haven't, is, but it is a discussion. This is important to, to make this kind of exercise because paper affect all. No, no problem. I, I write what I think, no problem. But when I put the, what is in the paper to run, begin the problem. So the, a couple of years ago, we did mobilize the Brazil-based OSRL stack to the key side, and it was an actual uh, potential emergency event. So it, was, it wasn't a drill, it was an actual event. We never mobilized it onto the vessel and sent it offshore, but all of the engineering, all of the, the workflow, um, mobilizing of the assets in an emergency response into the country, assembling everything, getting the craneage, doing all of that was performed for a particular operator. So the mission plan was executed. The mission plan was executed to the key side. Key side. Key side. So oh, it, okay. it is only and and, and okay. Fred on, on on that we've we've and I'm a big proponent of role playing games, you know, and ex and and just tabletop exercises where you go beyond just the key side exercise. You also <laughs> visualize what would happen in an emergency. You have and I think it, it it's really work that that would um everybody would benefit from in Brazil to build a number of scenarios that we would maybe IBP is is a good uh forum to have those discussions. Uh the most natural um with with support from SPE and you know maybe the the the, the work group and OSRL and IOGT etc. We all yeah. get together and we say okay what are good relevant scenarios for Brazil and then we work them through. What services are we going to need? Who has vessels? Uh, where do we find a stack? Where do we find the debris removal uh, kit? Um, what do we do for containment or, or collection? 
Uh, how fast can we develop a relief well, you know, et cetera. And then in, in probably in a workshop, on a, in a series of workshops, we would greatly improve the, the overall common response capability. Uh, and so we'd, we'd definitely improve the preparedness. Yeah. So to, to your point on that, the GSRN, right, yep. that exists. Yeah. You have access as a signatory to those people. Mm -hmm. These companies were the ones that we mobilized the two assets last year. We now have through Technip, um, they have a functional execution plans that are, I would say, 80% complete as guidance documents that we could then make vessel specific. The same thing for the rigging, the same thing for the Med Ocean studies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I, Gustavo has, has got a couple of more questions here, and 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 I want to I want to touch on those. Um, the, the, another one is: there any regulatory pressure towards signing a capping contract? Now I can't answer that for Brazil, um, but I'm sure Pierre Edouard probably has an opinion on that. I'm assuming yeah. that it's an absolute requirement. You need to have yeah. a, you need to be a subscriber. <laughs> Absolutely, if you drill if you drill a well, then then yes. Okay. <laughs> The next one, the relief well project is an operator's responsibility. Yes. Do OSRL have a consultant team within for access to? Yes. So again, part of the global subsea response network is we have access, to, you have access to well well control. You have access to add energy. Um, these are both well control specialist companies through my um through my supplemental response network you have access to well engineers these are all phd pe petroleum engineers that have um depth of experience in relief well operations they you can contract through us into them as part of this again this 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 hopeful regional response network um but you as the operator would be responsible for them, but you can get access to them through us. Yeah. Now the benefit of coming to us for this is we've handpicked these individual companies and these, and these operators. They, they, they're the ones that know this space intimately. And these are the ones that we've been working with for the last 10 years since Macondo. So, um, I, that's all I can say uh, specific yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, you yes, get access yes, to the, you get the creme de la creme of of reservoir and well is, engineering. It is it is a requirement. It's not the only option. You can get that kind of coverage and that kind of service. You know, the the pre drill work regarding relief well drilling you can get through other companies. But uh, but 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 yes, there there is virtue in in going with somebody who has strong references and and will do quality work absolutely so, so what we use them for when we do these exercises and and i'm talking i'm talking to exxon i'm talking chevron i'm talking bp i'm talking all of the super majors now we will bring in in the exercise i will bring in well control specialists that will sit with flow engineering and reservoir engineering and they're the ones that are intimate with the well control of the reservoir, the responses of the individual capping stacks in a shut in, and they will work with them. So they will become their their on site Google, if you will, to answer any of these questions and work hand in hand with the reservoir team. Because in a lot of these exercises, you know, there's sort of a disconnect between flow engineering, reservoir engineering, and the source control guys. And what I bring to the table when we hold these events is I bring in the critical personnel that can sit in each of these individual at these individual desks and are the dotted line between the two or three organizations. But Brad, do, do you remember in Macondo when a BP begins to shoot in the, the well and uh, the, the people that uh, is, is the, the consult people don't agree with the, the procedures. Mm -hmm. BP need to go to Stafford. I don't remember Stafford in California, American University in California, to get people 
that uh, make a uh, procedure. That wasn't that wasn't driven by BP. That wasn't driven by the operator. That was driven by governmental oversight. Yeah, they, they were the, the ones the, that were driving the, this. The, the BP uh, conduce this kind of study and and it, uh, uh, submit it to approval and begins to shoot in the well. Uh, th this is the, 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 the most important problem, is, is to think outside the box. Uh, the, the people that is working with uh, the problem is, is maybe, is, is, uh, I can say, don't see outside the box. And the, the, the most important problem is capping is in the, 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 the BOP damage. Not uh, relief well. Relief well is is, is a, a more simple solution because uh, it's uh, like uh, you it's drill a well. It's, it's a conventional it's, drill. It's conventional. You don't have yeah, problems. With, with some the arguably, problem is arguably, you, so, arguably so on frontier wells, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, especially when, when you, you don't you make it. an exercise, study what kind of damage could be occurring in yeah, the BOP yeah. and it's yeah. established this kind of problem to solution of the people. So what think we do with our exercises, Frederico, when, when we sit down and we plan these exercises, we look at them holistically and we'll actually, so one of the things that I bring to the table with me is an ROV simulator, okay? And uh, I simulate the actual shut-in of the capping stack. We don't have to take it offshore. We don't have to go through the expense of actually deploying a capping stack onto a well. And, and, you, and, you know, burning assets with a vessel and ROV crews. I have an ROV pilot and I have an ROV simulator and I have everything modeled in there. But I work with IMT and I work with the team and we come up with a plausible scenario that we then work through the exercise. But we always put contingency in there and we always try. So as a classic example, okay, Occidental Petroleum, we did an exercise. I had the ROV simulator there. We had a failure that when we were doing the shut-in, we got to the last choke on the last outlet and we were shutting it in and it actually started to drop below the minimum uh, pressure response curve, the min value in our soft oh. shut-in. That prompted them to stop because that was indicative of a potential broach. There was something that was going on, but we weren't physically shutting in the well. The pressure was going somewhere. So yeah. that immediately stopped in the simulator. Two things that kicked off two things. It kicked off the source control. They immediately had to stop their shut in procedure and they had to reverse it. And then they had to sit around the table and, and generate an MOC on this. And then they had to start looking at what would be a mechanical issue that would bring this result. But we also then had to work with the reservoir team because up until that point, the reservoir was trending. So what would cause this? So this forced them to start looking at their contingency, their contingency issues. There was two possible payouts here. It could have been either choke washout, which is a viable concern when you're shutting in on a high discharge well. The other thing was that we had casing issues and because this was a deviated well, and we could probably have casing failure in a reservoir, and we had a secondary reservoir coming in to the actual, into the in conductor. And with that scenario, it would come to these, you would get these levels because it was cross flow between two reservoirs. Yeah. So, by but sand. that's what we worked in that exercise. And it turned out, so while the reservoir guys are running around with their heads cut on fire trying to figure out potential scenarios that would show this, we actually had the subsea guys doing a mechanical, okay, if it's washout, isolate this, go to this leg, isolate this leg, work contingencies on the actual capping stack to see if this, this um, choke wasn't washed out or isolate the leg, bring the choke back to surface. We can do that with exercises right now, Frederico. And, We've done that and, for the last four or five years, it, but it comes down to a lot of pre-planning. Exactly. And and those those exercises, they can be 
tabletop for a fraction of the cost of actual deployment, oh, yeah. which is, which is necessary, yeah. but but thinking about contingencies and what sort of good kit you might need for at least a, a reasonable number of situations, that would go probably a long way in um, you know avoiding avoiding to go unprepared. Uh, to, yeah. to to a, to a specific event, and, and that's where the scenarios worked for a specific region, specifically Brazil, with the portfolio makes makes good sense because that that's a, a smaller set mm -hmm. of scenarios that if you look worldwide, you you point the focus on one specific region where you can decide, you know, this is scenario one, this is scenario two, this is scenario three, and then you work the different cases. This is what could happen. I could have an obstruction while drilling uh, that prevents capping. So I'm going to need debris. Then you might talk about explosives, you know, removing, cutting, severing a, a riser, etc. cetera. That, that's, that's, I think that would be a very good. We're going to run out of time. We've already run out of time, actually. So uh, <laughs> as, as a conclusion, I'll just say that we've talked before the, the event started about potentially a visit that might happen through SPE or with some of the student chapters. And I think it's a great idea. Uh, Fred is with the... Uh, uh, comité, the, the 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 work group on emergency response, and and uh, yeah, we can easily push for that to happen through SP Brazil. Have a group of interested people see how we can make it happen. It it will have to limit the number of attendees, but if if there is a will, I'm sure we can find a way uh, to to make it happen. Yeah, so we've we've hosted open houses in the past. Uh, we yeah. love doing it. Yeah. Um, the the last one they did down there was. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I, I don't know if there's a restriction on the number of people, but um, I mean, it's a big warehouse. We can accommodate a lot of people. Yep, we can talk talk practicalities, and, but and, yeah, I think it's worth it's worth you know following up with further discussions. Yeah, by all means, reach out to Vicente. Yeah. Um, Very good. So. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank, thanks a lot for your time, uh, Brett. Uh, I think that that was very good. It, it income. It, I think it recaps a number of key considerations for Brazil, specifically for emergency response and, and preparedness. And and hopefully we'll continue discussions. We started that discussion previously on having a sort of Brazilian focused uh, GSRN or, or new new partners added there, considering the number of smart smart people and good companies that are available there in in, in brazil well um, and not only brazil you know you've got yeah, 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 you've got the suriname basin absolutely it's, it's a absolutely. short flight from rio you yeah. got to go through panama unfortunately i don't know no, what's no. all the <laughs> copa but you know yeah oh so just to, to your point the just the stack um when we bring the stack into guyana um, we're going to be the, the technicians. One of the technicians is coming out of Houston, but the remainder are coming out of Rio. Um, you know, Trendsetter do Brazil are in Rio, and they have they have local technicians, and these are the guys that are going to be working on that stack. Yeah, yeah. So um, there there is a Brazilian contingent in Guyana, and um, you've got a fantastic workforce, and I'd love to be able to get access to them outside of Brazil. Uh, absolutely. All right. So thank thank you again, uh, Brett. Uh, thanks, uh, Fred, for uh, agreeing to to be with us on the call and, and moderating that uh, that event. Thank you, Jan, for being backstage and extending uh, this, allowing, <laughs> giving your time to extend extend the call. And uh, we hope to see you again at uh, the next edition of uh, SP Brazil Tech Tuesday. Yeah. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. We stay with yours.